I'm appreciative of the gracious invitation to come and participate in this program and to uh, have uh, some small part in dealing with a subject that uh, I believe is so pressing. Liberalism is one of the greatest dangers, in fact, possibly the greatest danger today, facing the Lord's church. It, is, it, it uh, consists of several heads. It has a religious or theological head. It has a philosophical head. And it also has a moral component or head. And Brother Moser did an excellent job just a moment ago, in effect, dealing with all aspects of that. He summarized it uh, very succinctly. And we appreciate the fine work that uh, he did, and we also appreciate this good congregation, the eldership here, Brother Hatcher, and uh, wish you Godspeed in every endeavor. Liberalism and Calvinism. Really, today, there are very few hardline, consistent Calvinists who understand and who live by and practice and, and teach Calvinism as John Calvin taught it and understood it. Uh, the reason is there are so many problems that arise when you do that that are immediately uh, repulsive to uh, especially modern sensitivities. The idea, for instance, of double predestination. Calvin taught not only that the elect are predestinated individually, unconditionally, unchangeably for salvation, he also contended that the non-elect were just as equally, unconditionally, individually, and unchangeably predestinated for hell. Well, modern Calvinists don't like people to know that. They don't want to tell folks that that if you're not of the elect, you may as well go have fun because you're, you can't do anything about it anyway. You're going to hell and God's already determined that that's the case. But that's what Calvin taught. That was his exact position. It's in his own writings. And I have a few uh, volumes of his material I've read, including his Institutes of the Christian Religion. His doctrine of preterition involves this idea of individual, unconditional, and unchangeable double predestination. There is just no way to get around it. But another thing is, because of the influence of philosophy, and Brother Tom Warren used to say that philosophers lead the theologians around by the nose. And that's the case. Men such as Kant and Kierkegaard and Schleiermacher and all of these other various individuals who have come along uh, uh, have been in their theological views and ideas have been tied to in some fashion the writings of philosophers whether it's Nietzsche whether it is uh, uh, Georg Friedrich Hegel whether it's David Hume or whoever it may be these individuals have set the stage and the theologians come along and try to adapt their view of the Bible and of religion within the frameworks that are set by the, the by the philosophers. And since the dominant philosophy today is principally existentialism, then the view of the Bible has to fit that framework. That's why it's all a matter of just your personal experience. Existence, you see, is subject to your own individual perception. And your perception may differ from my perception, and that's why you can't tell me uh, what I'm doing is wrong, and I can't tell you what you're doing wrong, even though I tell you anyway. And that's what the liberal does. The liberal will tell us that we're wrong for telling them they're wrong. But given their position, we're right even when we're wrong. But that's where you wind up with liberalism. And so the type of Calvinism we're dealing with today is really a modified Calvinism that hops and skips from one view to the next depending on the situations and circumstances the Calvinist gets himself into on certain issues. And really, it involves not just Calvinistic ideas, but I've read books written by some of our brethren in which they're proposing to teach Calvinism and uh, they will go from Calvinism to Lutheranism to Arminianism to Wesleyanism 
to holiness doctrine, to Pentecostalism, back to Calvinism, and make the circuit again and again and again, now and then throwing in just enough truth to make it palatable to the, to the weak-minded. And uh, well, I, we have a fellow up in Texas, uh, up in Virginia, for instance, that's teaching grace only, but because he pays a little bit of attention to baptism, some of the brethren up there thinks he's a sound teacher. Simply because he'll pay, pay lip service to baptism. Now, I'll have more to say about that in a moment. But they will move from Calvinism to Lutheranism, all of these other various isms. And you know what ism means? <laughs> That's right. That's what Brother Wallace used to say. Ism means it just ain't so. And But they will go to all of these things and uh, present it as though this is Calvinism or this is the truth and so on. And what's fascinating about this, as they do this, as they move from one view to the next, to the next, to that, they'll pretend like they never did. They never uh, contradicted themselves. Uh, they never uh, violated the law of non-contradiction or anything like that. In fact, really, they pretend there's no such thing. Brother Mosier was uh, referring to the uh, the love of the liberals, and I've experienced that myself a few times. Uh, but uh, their love can be expressed. Brother uh, Clad Wallace years ago said of the old bold uh, premillennial party, so they walk around with sugar in one hand and acid in the other. And if you don't eat their sugar, they splatter you with, the, with, with their acid. And brethren, the liberals today don't have, the, the bowl party don't have anything on today's modern liberals. They uh, practice the same stuff. Well, what is Calvinism? Calvin's basic system, which is actually derived from Augustine, and he came about his view from the reverse of Augustine. The Augustine held that because he was so morally corrupt, you go read his confession you'll see a man who uh, recognized his own many imperfections and in the long run he didn't do really all that much about it because uh, he never fully came out of this stuff. But Augustine wanted to justify his own weaknesses but yet maintain some sort of semblance of religious belief. And so he came to the conclusion, well, I can't be sinning because it's God's fault. It must be something inherent in me, and uh, hence I am totally depraved. I am suffering from the fall and uh, from original sin, and I have this taint within my uh, self that makes me uh, incapable of doing anything but good. I mean, but evil, excuse me. And uh, so then he concluded, well, because I'm this way, then the only thing that can be done to save me, God's got to do it. Salvation must come solely, wholly, totally from God. And uh, this is the basis of the Augustinian system. He accepted first the assumption of original sin, which is the foundation of total depravity, and then came to the idea of absolute sovereignty that ruled out free will. That is, genuine free will. Calvin had a very severe bent of mind as a young man right from the outset as a theologian, as a student. In uh, fact, his uh, classmates referred to him as the old objecting case because of his severe bent of mind. And he concluded that because God is so sovereign and salvation must be solely, wholly, totally of God, as Augustine had, he came to the reverse conclusion that therefore... If man's in need of salvation, it must be because man's totally depraved. He's unable to do anything relative to his own salvation. And so he comes to the same position as Augustine, but in reverse order. Calvin went on to teach, from his view of total depravity, the idea of the tulip, or what became known as the tulip. Because man is totally depraved, those that would be saved must be unconditionally elected. Salvation is by grace alone. Period. And 
because it is by grace alone, then there must be a limited atonement. Only a certain few are going to be elected. As I said, he believed in devil predestination. And so God looked down, as it were, through the halls of time, and He said, Keith Mosier, I don't know why, but I like you. And I'm going to let you go to heaven regardless of what you do prior to that. Somewhere along the line, I am going to send my Spirit upon you and compel you so you'll be saved. But Paul Brantley, I know that they recognize goodness and so on in you on various occasions, but I've decided I don't like you. And I'm going to send you to hell regardless of what you do. In fact, I'm even going to make you do things that will justify the fact I am sending you to hell. One Calvinist, Edward Palmer, made this statement. He said, God ordained, He ordained the beating heart. That's what He said. Every beat of the heart. You have a heart attack, it's God's fault. He caused it to strike. You thought it was all those Twinkies you ate. God did it. He plotted against you. He made you do it. He even ordained the writing of the hand. The writing of the pen. And even the slip of the pen. He ordained the drink. He ordained the drinker. And He ordained the drinking. And so when you become a drunk, God poured the booze down your throat. Now the Calvinist doesn't like you to tell that. Doesn't like you to explain it that way. But that's how they put it in their own writing. It's in their own book. And so the idea of limited atonement, you've got to have a sacrifice. You've got to explain the purpose of the sacrifice of Jesus. God's already ordained these individuals. They're going to be saved. But what do you do about the sacrifice of Jesus? That's a historical fact. You can't get around it. Well, He died only for those elect. And every passage has to be twisted, molded, shaped to fit that particular theory. Then you come to irresistible grace. Here is the actual carrying out of the compulsion or compelling of the individual to be saved contrary even to their will. In fact, they don't really have will. It's mere appearance. God, what, what, when the Calvinist talks about free will, he, it is you are free to do what your nature compels you to do. Because you're totally depraved, your nature is going to compel you to always do evil. And so some Calvinists will consistently say that when you're uh, an alien sinner, you can't do anything good. Even when you do good, it's evil. That was a position Ben Bogard wound up taking in some debates. Even when a man went out who was an alien sinner and took care of his family, worked hard, and earned money, and bought it home, took care of his kids, fed his ship, he was doing evil. The whole time, everything he did, when he kissed that baby and put it to bed at night, that was a sin. That's how far they went with it. Well, how do you take care of that? You send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes into the heart of the individual and zaps him and zaps him up and strengthens him and lays a whammy on him and turns him around and turns him upside down, right side out, and every which way. And before you know it, he's saved. And, you know, and he's not only saved, but he is saved to such an extent that he can never so sin as to be eternally lost. Now here's where some Calvinists will part company. When they get to that point, some will say that he cannot sin at all. They take a perfectionist view. And that everything he does, it may have the appearance of sin on the part of man, but it's not sin. If he's really saved, he's not sin. He'll never sin, period. The others will say, well, yeah, he may commit sin, and he even may lapse into sin, but somewhere along the line, God's going to wake him up, bring him back, and he will never die in sin. Well, if that's the case, then pick your sin, stay in it. Just stay in it, and you'll never die. You'll live right here on the face of this earth for the rest of your life. You want to be a drunkard? Be a drunkard. God won't let you die as a drunk. You want to be a fornicator? Go practice fornication. Given this doctrine, you will never die as long as you keep on practicing fornication if you're of the elect. Now, that's a miserable doctrine. 
And then there are some that say, well, yes, they will lapse into sin. In fact, they may even go deeply into it. But despite everything they do, they're going to be saved anyway. They'll take that position. I was working with a young man when I was working Gilmore Moving and Storage many years ago. <coughs> and this uh, gentleman said, when we were in the uh, a warehouse of the company, he said, I could walk into the office in there. I could kill all the men. I could rape all the women. I could die on the spot. And I'd still go to heaven. That's how strongly I believe it. You know, some of those old hard-bitten warehousemen and workers that were standing around there, they shook their head. They said, we don't even go to church. We can't believe that foolishness. And they walked off from it. But that's the tulip doctrine in a nutshell. And it takes a nut to believe it. It's false doctrine. It's off. But brethren, what is sad about it is we are seeing brethren in the Lord's church teaching various facets of this, of this foolishness. For instance, you ever heard the name of Randy Mayhew? Randy Mayhew openly boasted that he was a Calvinist when he was let go at... Uh, Preston Road in Dallas, Texas. He went on to establish a church of professional wrestling in Dallas. Some of the preachers in the area referred to it as the church of the open body slam. <coughs> he was a Calvinist. I don't think he understood the Calvinism, but he claimed to be a Calvinist. But there are many others. Ruba Shelley, Max Licato, Max Licato's appeal to the, uh, the sinner's prayer. You know what's fascinating about that is these folks will ridicule those who believe that there are five steps in salvation. They'll mock and they'll, they'll say, well, if uh, Walter Scott had had six fingers, we'd have the six-step exercise. And all of that type of foolishness. <coughs> they will laugh and mock and jeer. And they will say, we're trying to teach people work salvation and trying to, to earn their way through baptism. And yet, here is a fellow that wants someone to come down to the prayer altar and bend his knee down at a prayer altar and spend his time praying and trying to pray through. And that's not work. That's not work. Well, maybe these brethren don't work at prayer. But I try to. Maybe they don't believe that work if that prayer is something they're doing. Maybe they believe that the prayer that they're offering is somehow God's making them pray or God's saying the prayer on their behalf. There's not a one of these fellows that are consistent with themselves. They will say that go and pray through, which involves an action that the individual has to, has to uh, commit or practice or do in order to be saved. And yet, somehow that's not earning your salvation. Somehow that's not doing a work. Somehow that's not doing something in order to be saved. And that's not consistent. That's self-contradictory. They'll say, well, we believe in salvation by grace only through faith only. And they've got too many onlys. And too many other propositions involved in that that are self-contradictory. If it's by grace only, how can it be through faith? If it's through faith only, how can it be by grace? They cannot explain that. They don't even attempt to do it. Some years ago in a gospel meeting in uh, Lake Placid, Florida, I was dealing with the subject of grace only and how uh, we are not saved by grace alone. Yes, we are, brethren, saved by grace, but not grace alone. Grace is God's part. The faith in the... Uh, and that's how it reads in the original in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It is by grace through the faith, that is through the gospel system, that we're saved. And that entails what we must do in response to that system. The terms that are laid out in order to be saved by the grace of God. Go down and look at verse 10. Verse 10 that says that in Him we, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. How do you get into Christ? How do you get there? Yes, you're saved by grace, 
but it is in Christ Jesus where you are a workmanship of God. You are His masterpiece. Where? In Him. How did you get there? Your baptism didn't have a thing to do with it. Read Galatians 3, 26-29. These folks say grace only. Grace only. And uh, yes, it's by grace, but it is by the grace of God through our obedience to the faith. We have to respond to what God has given. What God's provision. You do a word study on the word grace. The word charis. Examine it in the New Testament. And notice how many things are said to have been given by the grace of God. Even the work and office of the position of the apostles is said to be as a result of His grace. Everything that God has done is doing and shall do toward our salvation. Ultimately in heaven, everything is of His grace, of His loving kindness. Brother Dehoff made this observation. He said, I, I guess I've held about a hundred debates with Baptist preachers over the years. And he said, I don't know of one of them that ever defined what grace was. Not a one. They couldn't explain it. Because according to this concept of grace of Calvin it's something that's just floating out there and then sometime, somehow uh, just drops down on you like a giant egg or something out of the sky. Just something falls down on you and that's it. That's God's grace. But that is not Bible teaching. The grace of God comprehends everything that God has done, is doing and shall do toward our salvation. The faith contemplates everything that man does in response to what God has provided, including the proper use of the Word of God which was dealt with earlier by Brother Mosier. Another thing, another influence we see of this grace-only doctrine is being, it is being promoted through the writings of a man named Rick Warren. Put it down, if you've got a congregation in this area using the Rick Warren books, either one of them or both, The Purpose Driven Church, The Purpose Driven Life, they've also got one, The Purpose Driven Youth Ministry, that's written by the youth minister where Warren is the Baptist preacher. And by the way, he is a liberal Baptist, and there are some Baptists that won't have anything to do with him because he's so liberal among the Baptists. They think he, they think he is so liberal. He is really a Pentecostal liberal a Pentecostal Baptist. But in these books, you go through and read them, the common thread is that of, of uh, grace-only salvation tied together with uh, Pentecostal, Holy Roller, Hoot and Annie worship. You want the summation of those two books, that's what it's about. And that's not by accident, brethren. The man that... Uh, that Rick Warren studied under was C. Peter Wagner. C. Peter Wagner is, or was, I guess he still is, professor of church growth at uh, Fuller Theological Seminary. I like to call it cemetery. A theological seminary is where you go to bury your faith. And that's what these folks have done. Well, C. Peter Wagner is a Pentecostal preacher that's where he had his start. That's his background. And he taught that there are three waves of the Holy Spirit in the 20, 20th century. The first wave was in 1901, the Azusa Street meeting, in the beginning of the, of the Pentecostal movement. The second wave he assigns to the work of Oral Roberts and the Old Sawdust Trail in the 1940s and 50s. The third wave, he contends, is currently going on and it is the mainstream movement. He does not like to call it charismatic even though it is the charismatic movement, just in a little different form. That is seeking to go mainline to make it palatable to other religious groups and to the various denominational bodies. His three leading supporters were Bill Hybels, 
recognize that name, Rick Warren and John Wimber. Wimber's now dead, but he started the Vineyard Church movement. And the other two have started their own brand of community church movement. Brethren, C. Peter Wagner's disciple, Rick Warren, has laid out in those two volumes, Purpose Driven Church, Purpose Driven Life, has laid out a blueprint. In fact, look on the back of the covers of each of those books. They call it a blueprint. That You know what's fascinating? The liberals say this isn't a blueprint. It's not a pattern. You, we don't need pattern theology. Well, what about, what about the Rick Warren book? Yeah, they're a pattern. They're a blueprint for doing church in the 21st century. And they teach grace only, faith only, and so on. I was talking with a young man congregation that uh, this young man was promoting it. And uh, he said, Brother Denham, there's nothing wrong with that book. There, there are some really good things in that book. And uh, I questioned him on it. He said, well, yeah, there are some things that are, that are, that are off. But, but there are some really good things. I said, name one. After he stuttered for a moment or two, he said, well, over in the third chapter, I said, you've got to read all the way to the third chapter before you found the first thing you can recommend. And then he sputtered us some more and finally said, well, I know it's that I just can't remember it. You're pressuring me. I just can't remember it. And I asked him his name, and I called his name Adam Davis, Hampton Congregation uh, in uh, uh, Virginia. He said, uh, uh, I uh, uh, think there's some good things there. I said, well, Brother Davis, have you ever heard of affected meaning? That you can have a statement that itself, by itself, would be true, but within the context in which it is found is altered by what is around it, either by what is in the sentence or in the sentences before the sentence after or within the paragraph itself, that in effect refutes what is being said or poisons it? Have you never heard of rat poison? You know, 97% of what the rat gets is good stuff. It's the 2 or 3% that kills him. But brethren, you'll have a hard time finding 97% of good stuff in these two books. I can't find any of it. Not a whit. That is not in some fashion poisoned by Calvinism and so on uh, in this book. Other false doctrines that are being taught in conjunction with this grace-only Calvinistic doc, uh, system. Uh, Jack Exum, uh, and I urge you to read the manuscript. I document these claims concerning Jack Exum and what he claims. He says, for instance, on uh, pages 45 and 46, in a book entitled The ABCs of Grace, Are you saved by grace? You say, Yes, I am. Then as you travel, you will grow in the grace of God in praying, singing, going, giving, saving, sacrificing, reading, encouraging, studying, meditating. The grace that saves you will be the grace that keeps you. You cannot be saved by the power of God and be kept by the power of man. Then he goes on to say, For by grace are you saved through faith. 100% of salvation is by grace. We don't deserve any of it. We can't earn it, buy it, or in any way merit it. He also contends, relative to uh, salvation by grace, that as pertains to works, that works are excluded. That works, good works, only come in after salvation, not before. Well, I wonder about John uh, six twenty nine, that this is a work of God that you believe on Him whom He hath sent. These brethren don't even seem to to be familiar with the fact that faith itself is a work, and they'll turn right around and say that faith saves. Faith's involved in our salvation. On page forty eight, he says. Uh, after he uh, demurred on the concerning human power to be saved, he ruled that out. Uh, he then says, 
quote, everything, 100%, that we receive from God comes by His grace. Now watch this next statement. Everything, 100% of all we receive by grace is accepted by faith. Our faith is a response to God's grace. So how can it be 100% of the one, but it's also 100% of the other? I guess that's new math. On pages 71 and 72, he makes this indictment of the Lord's church. He claims that the last 50 years we have neglected the subject of grace. Brethren, I deny that. I deny that. He says we have taught a human law work system. I deny that. We have taught subsequently salvation by human works only. And I deny that. He doesn't try to prove any of it. Getting back to a statement made earlier by Brother Dehaw. Brother George made this observation in Chattanooga some years back. And he said, Brethren, every time I stand up and I preach on the death of Jesus Christ, I'm preaching on the grace of God. Every sermon I've ever preached on the plan of salvation, I'm preaching on the grace of God. Every time I raise my voice and emphasize what the Bible teaches, on the church, the one church for which Jesus died, I'm preaching on the grace of God. I may not use the word grace, but every bit of it is provided by God's matchless grace. And my response to it, what I do concerning it, is made by the provision of God. That is, he has graciously offered me the opportunity to do so, without which I wouldn't have a chance. That's the grace of God. Anyway, Brother Axel needs to go back and study his ABCs. There's another book promoting Calvinism. Many of you know Bill Love's book, The Poor Gospel. There, uh, the Grace of uh, the Heart of Fire by Milton Jones and some others. But there's one I wanted to bring to your attention that's recently out. It's a book by a man named William Merle Worthy. And I go into detail on Brother Worthy's doctrine. He is teaching the idea of imputed righteousness. And this is tied to the idea of salvation by grace only. In fact, Worthy states that he believes fully what Calvin taught on imputed righteousness. That he agrees with Calvin and he agrees with Luther and so on. When I pressed him on it and pointed out how he was contradicting the Calvinist he was quoting in support of his own position, he said he has since come up with a position to a, a Brother Howard Burnett. He told Brother Howard Burnett in uh, Virginia that, well, all of those other Calvinists had it wrong. For the past 500 years, they've just had it wrong. And uh, he's going to straighten it out in his next edition. He's going to put out another edition of the book. But he claims that we receive the personal righteousness of Jesus. But it's not transferred. It's imputed. But we receive it. But it's not transferred. It's given. We have it. But we didn't get it. We got it. But it wasn't transferred to us. What's fascinating in this man's writing, he tra takes the writings of Brother Guy and Woods, Brother Keith Mosier, Alexander Campbell, James Burton Kaufman, Robin Haley, and I don't think Brother Haley even knows about this yet, and others, and he quotes and cites their material, and he either misrepresents what they're saying and then attacks the misrepresentation. Or he takes what they say and tries to twist it as though they're in agreement with him. He does that in Brother Woods and Brother Mosier. And when I pointed this out to him, he said, no, I wasn't misrepresenting Brother Woods. I knew all along he didn't agree with me. I just wanted to use his definition. He knew that Brother Woods in his defining of the term imputed righteousness as pertained to Calvinism involved the notion of transferring the personal righteousness of Jesus. And it comes out of this, brethren, and I challenge any one of you out there, you may believe this, that you have the personal righteousness of Jesus in some way being applied to you. 
mystically or otherwise. You find in Romans 4 or James 2, which talks about imputation in any form or fashion, you find in every one of those chapters any reference to the personal righteousness of Jesus Christ. I've challenged each one of these men to do so, and they still haven't come up with a verse. They cannot do so. You know one of the passages tried to use? 1 Corinthians 1.30 Jesus is to us has become to us our wisdom, righteousness, so on. I ask him, do you have all the wisdom of Jesus? If you have the personal righteousness of Jesus, that same passage would imply you have the same wisdom. But if he had the same wisdom, he wouldn't have written the stupid thing he did. He wouldn't have made the blunder. And brethren, there's another book right along with that. And it's kind of skated free on this thing. But it teaches the personal righteousness uh, imputation theory too. And that's David Chadwell's book. Having the Faith of Abraham. You read that book. It teaches it. And it is false doctrine. And you say, well, how do you know that? I was a Calvinist. That was... He says it's the truth. He says I misrepresented him. He says I'm off the mark. And so on. But he will not put his John Hancock on the propositions to defend the book he's written. Something's wrong somewhere. The fact of the matter is, Calvinism is a false doctrine. It is an ungodly doctrine. It makes God the specter of men. It says that in effect, God can show respect to Brother Moser and save him regardless of what he does. In fact, he'll even make him do those things that... Uh, will justify, at least in the mind of God, saving Moses. But, he will also cause Paul Brantley to do those things that in his own mind, again, will justify sending Paul Brantley to hell. And there wills not one whit involved in it. All of those passages, come unto me, all of you that labor in their hell, they're meaningless. They don't have any impact. Brethren, we're about, and ladies and gentlemen, to extend the invitation. Whosoever will, let him come. That's the plea of the Gospel. That has been the plea since the first century. And really, that's been the plea in every age that God has ever dealt with man. He deals with man not as sticks and stones, as bricks and brickbats. He deals with man as He created him, a rational, thinking, moral being with the ability to choose to obey or disobey. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Calvin says it's impossible. The choice was already made before you were born. Joshua says, no, you need to choose this day. If you're subject to the invitation, whether it is to obey the Gospel or become a New Testament Christian, Repenting of your sins, confessing Christ, being baptized to have your sins washed away. Not because a preacher said so, but because the Word of God teaches in Acts 2 verse 38. The Bible teaches it. That settles it. Then do so. Whether you are a child of God in need of prayers to be restored, you need to recognize the doctrine of the perseverance and preservation of the saints. Once saved, always saved. That's a false doctrine. And some of my brethren, we teach against it, but then we turn right around and practice it. You need to come out of that. Give that up. Be restored. Ask for the prayers of the saints on your behalf. While the other is standing. Amen.